no question about it. And every conversation, every show that we've ever done, I've just walked away just a little bit smarter. Some call him the beard of knowledge. That's right. Randall Carlson, master builder, architectural designer, teacher, geometrician, geomythologist, geological explorer, and renegade scholar. He has four decades of study and research and exploration into the interface between ancient mysteries and modern science and has been an active Freemason for 30 years and is past master of one of the oldest and largest Masonic lodges in Georgia. Now, his work incorporates ancient mythology, astronomy, earth science, paleontology, symbolism, sacred geometry, architecture, geomancy, and other arcane and scientific traditions. For over 25 years, he has presented classes, lectures, and multimedia programs synthesizing this information for the students of the mysteries. And, of course, he will be presenting and teaching at our Soul Tech 2.0 in Loveland, Colorado. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the beard of knowledge, Randall Carlson. Randall, good evening. Well, thanks for having me back, Jimmy. You know, Randall, there are there are voices that I hear once in a while that just relax me and take me into that zone. You know, you've got that gift. <laughs> you've got that gift. Yeah, well, let's just head into the zone now yeah, well, for a couple hours. Yeah, let's do that. And and have you – take me back for a second. Um, have you always – had that gift. I, I, let's go back to when you were like five years old and you're hanging out with your friends. Were you, well, you didn't have a beard, but <laughs> were you that, were you that guy, you know, growing up too? I actually, I think I became that guy at seven. Tell me about it. Uh, how, how did you figure it out? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with where we lived at the time and also the fact that I just had parents and grandparents that encouraged an interest in, in many things. Um, we lived in rural Minnesota. We had land on the edge of a lake, which was one of these leftover puddles from the great ice age and living there until I was nine years old, pretty much. And, um, just becoming, how can I say it? Sort of just becoming very much enchanted with this landscape. Um, I actually then moved away for a couple of two and a half years, but then came back and then continued living uh, in the same area, on the same lake in a different house, but uh, right up until I was uh, 16. So then um, spent most of my first 16 years uh, living there in this environment in rural Minnesota and um you know, I just I remember early on learning about the Great Ice Age and being really fascinated by that. And I, I you know, I couldn't have been seven or eight years old at that point, I guess. Um, you mentioned your parents and your grandparents, um, which is always, you know, the guidance that sets you on your path for life. We all go through that, no matter what, if it's a good relationship or a bad one, it, it, it sets you on your path. So when you say that they encourage these things, were were they cool? Were they uh, were they reading Blavatsky? You know, I don't know. I mean, what? Well, not what? quite. But my father, he was a, um, you know, he was basically well, he was a carpenter and a, a master carpenter, as was his dad. So I grew up when I was a, a kid. They had uh, Carlson and Son uh, home builders, and it would be the two of them and. They would build a house, pretty much do almost everything, and then sell the house, and then build another one and sell that. Um, so, you know, being around building, I'm sure had an influence <clears throat> because you know, building you're, 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 building is all about geometry, right? It's all about processes. Um, so that was a big part of it. But also the fact that my dad was a, a rather interesting fellow. He um, you know, he had no college, but he was a very smart man, and he was interested in a lot of things. So we had books uh, around the house about yoga, about martial arts, mm. about shamanism. And this, you know, we're talking about the 1950s. Um, <clears throat> so I, I remember a book uh, that he had was about Australian shamanism. And um, it was talking about 
their various practices, and that was very early. I guess eight, eight, nine years old was about the time I had learned how to read. I was, I was very intrigued by those kind of books. It was him that first told me about. He said, "Used to, well, you know, there used to be a big ice sheet here, or a big ice cap where we live, and it covered all the land, and it was, you know, thousands of feet thick, and when it melted away, that's why there's so many lakes around here." And um, which is, you know, exactly why there are so many lakes in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And so I think living in an environment where everything, every hill, every hollow, you know, every ridge, every lake, everything had been shaped by the presence of this, these great ice sheets and then the melting of these great ice sheets. Now, you don't really understand that. You don't consciously are aware of it. Growing up, you know, and, and you know, by the time we got 16, you know, we, we, me and my brothers and my friends from around, we, we rambled over that, that land for, for miles. I mean, and, you know, it was all privately owned land, but, you know, people didn't care. I mean, we, we were out, we usually, usually hardly ever even saw anyone. Sometimes we'd just be out, um, you know, we have canoe. We had canoes, so we lived on one end of the lake. We could paddle up to the other end of the lake, Schmidt Lake. A short portage over, we were at Bass Lake. Then we could paddle our canoes across Bass Lake. A short portage from there was Eagle Lake. We could paddle our canoes across there. We could spend all day out, you know, taking our canoes. And so, you know, this was the kind of things we were doing as boys at, mm-hmm. at 10 years old, 11, 12 years old. Then... uh you know, our nearest neighbors were all farmers. So I had a good, my best friend was a youngest boy uh, in a family, farm family with 10 kids. And we were the same age. We grew up together. So early on, you know, I'd play on the farm. And then by the time I think I turned 12 or 13, then I started working on the farm. And so doing farm work, I think, was an, an important component of you know, seeing how things work in in the real world, you know, as opposed to the way they might work in an urban environment where everything is regimented and, you know, it's all about social social climbing and this and that. When you're out on the farm, you know, it just, it is what it is. You know, I mean, we'd be out, you know, we'd find a, a carcass of a calf, for example. Right, uh, we right. We didn't know what, maybe you got the calf, but it might have been coyotes. Um, and then... You'd see over a period of weeks the carcass. Of, we'd be out there hiking around, walking around, whatever. We'd see the carcass of this calf, and then after several weeks, it had decayed. And then after a month, it would or two, it would be a skeleton out there. And then the following year, we'd go out and go. You know, there'd be no trace left of that of that animal. And so, you, you know, seeing things like that, I later on I would think back to that often when I'm studying things, you know, 30 years later, things like taphonomy, which is the study of fossilization and how an animal, what happens to an animal between the time it dies and the time it becomes a fossil? How how does that process occur? Of course, there's multiple processes, but in nature, what usually happens is that some creature dies and its constituent components get completely recycled, just like this remains of this calf that we would have found out in the field right you know by the following season or the end of the summer even there's nothing left see there's nothing there to become a fossil so a lot of i think was just being in an environment like that you know we had a you know winter the uh, lake would freeze over of course and then my grandfather would put uh, an ice house out on the on the ice auger a hole through it so i could go out there and sit with him and We'd catch fish. I, in the summer, I would sit on a log that had fallen over, a tree had fallen over the lake, and I would sit out there with my fishing pole and catch fish, and we would have cookouts in our backyard. And then the farm where my uh, best buddy lived, they, they boarded horses. So once I hit about 12, 13 years old and I started working on the farm, the main reason I worked was because after uh, the pay, you know, I think we maybe got 80 cents an hour, if that, right. um, <clears throat> for hard, brutal work of bra- hauling in hundreds of hay bales and that kind of stuff. But the reason I did it was so we could saddle up the horses after after work and go riding. Man, you had so a, I, you had it going on. I mean, I as did, a kid, see, that, and, that's pretty that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and I, of course, to me, that was just 
hey, this is the way it is. I took it for granted. I thought this is how everybody lived, you know. And it was only later, years later, I look back and I go, God, I was I was really lucky to have that kind of a situation. And um, I was, you know, we had, <clears throat> my mother had this huge garden. So, you know, she was constantly, you know, we were eating home, uh, you know, stuff we'd grown ourselves. We got most of our eggs and meat and cheese from farms within a, a, a mile or two of where we lived. So, I mean, this is, this is in the 1950s. And then in, but then my parents couldn't make it work for whatever reason. So 1960, they split up, they got divorced and my mother moved me and my three brothers with her back home where she was from, which was small town, Louisiana. So that was quite a different environment. But looking back now, I realize that now having a chance to spend two and a half years, you know, for now instead of, uh, you know, canoeing uh, up in a in a Minnesota lake, we're, you know, poling John boats through the bayous for a couple and a half, for two and a half years there. So it was just this contrast. I think it was the fact that there was so much rural uh, dimension to my growing up. Okay, now couple that with the fact that both my mother and my dad's mother <clears throat> both loved to read so there were books and uh i you know i, I guess let's say i was nine years old for my christmas or birthday present i get a subscription to all about books i don't know if you remember oh yeah those, was, i do remember that every month i'd get a new all about book it'd be all about electricity all about fossils right. you know all about the weather and I just really early on got very, very interested in science. You know, so the, I think. Well, let me let me jump ahead. in for one second because you said something that uh, had to affect you when when your grandfather or your father turns to you and says, "We were, you know, you're not seven, eight, nine years old," and says, "You know, there was, you know, there was a few thousand feet of ice above our heads at one point." Mm-hmm. That because you you don't you can't grasp it really how intense that is, but a few thousand feet might as well be ten miles in your mind, right? Yeah. You're picturing yeah. that, and, it, and and but yeah, this and at is that age too. At, yeah. at that age, and and to put it into a context here, imagine the Sears Tower in Chicago with another yeah. thousand feet of ice above it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or or Manhattan. Right, mm-hmm. completely yeah, with another thousand feet on top of that, or more. That's that's mm-hmm. what was going on back then, and that will change you. It changed me the first time I heard it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it I, well, here I am, whatever you know, sixty years later, and I'm remembering it. I, I, you know, of course, the memory has faded from you know what it was. You know, as you get older, it's kind of like maybe an old movie reel or something. It just gets worn and more worn. And, but, you know, I have these snapshot memories, and one of them is my dad telling me about that. You know, there had been ice there, and we had a book. Um, it might have been a book on geography. It seemed like it was a book on geography, and in there, looking at it, it had pictures. And In retrospect, I think the pictures were actually pictures of the Little Ice Age because, you know, there were a lot of these um, – you know, woodcuts and sketches and, and paintings made, particularly during the 17 and 1800s, mm-hmm. when all the glaciers were growing so uh, massively throughout the Alps and really around the world. Right. And the glaciers came down and swallowed up the farms in many cases. They moved into valleys. Um, and we had this book that had some of those pictures in it. And, and you know, in, in retrospect, I'm thinking, well, it was two different things. We're talking about the Great Ice Age, you know, when Minnesota was half covered in ice, we're going back ten to fifteen thousand years ago. Little Ice Age, we're going back two hundred years ago. But but it still made that same impression on me. I you know I had now a visual in my mind, seeing that picture in that geography book of these big you know big glaciers. I actually remember it was kind of unnerving. It was a little bit. It was almost like you know maybe a, a sort of a, a a dark thing rather than just. You know, now I, it, it's, you know, at some point it becomes, wow, this is awesome. But it was kind of awful in a way to think about that, you know, to a little kid, you know, thinking about 
wow, you know, because you don't have a framework. You don't have a framework. You don't understand, you know, ten, too much the difference between 10,000 years and 10 million years. Right. But, might as well be the same thing. And what about the other? Might as well be, the, yeah, the, I'm sorry. I just interrupted you. But there, no, go ahead. The uh, What about Minnesota is a very, very fascinating state, uh, as is you know, the Upper Peninsula and Wisconsin and and the Dakotas and Montana, very fascinating areas. But Minnesota has got a lot of fringe things going on there, uh, like the Kensington Ruinstone and mm -hmm, some of the sure. uh, ancient discoveries that uh, have uh, been found there. Did you know about any of that growing up? Oh, we, of course, you know, we'd all, I think, heard about the Kensington Ruinstone. Um Although my memory of it then was that I yeah certainly remember hearing about it early on probably in grade school right but I think the sort of the dominant opinion at the time was that it was a a more recent hoax whereas I think now you know I think they're willing to to concede that yeah it really is um, what five or six hundred years old anyway mm -hmm. um, so or maybe even older All right. Um, I, I'm not quite up to speed on the latest research on the Kensington Runestone. I know that, um, oh, what's his name? We know, Scott uh, Walter. Yeah, yeah, Scott. Scott Walter, yeah. He he would be the man to ask on that. Oh, yeah, um, we, we, we talked to Scott all the time. He was on with us last week. But but hmm. I, I recently saw, uh, I found a documentary. This is no joke. I can't even believe it. This was uh, six months ago. I'll find the link. I'll, I'll find out what it was, and I'll, I'll get it to you. It was literally a documentary from the 70s, from the 70s, uh, you know, square frame, right, three by four ratio, right, <laughs> documentary of ancient artifacts from Minnesota, right? Mm. Yeah, it was crazy. I had no idea. Of course, they covered the Kensington Ruinstone, but there was stuff being dug up every, you know, town and homestead and home site and things, uh, stuff that were being dug up all over Minnesota. And I had no idea. And they traveled to a couple of museums and little, you know, uh, backwoods museums and, and going uh, in these back rooms and, and revealing these different artifacts. And it was it was pretty nutty to see. One of them, uh, I want to get this right. There was a very small, I want to say it was like slate and maybe one and a half inches by one inches, a little like, like a pendant with Hebrew, ancient Hebrew Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> Dug up in Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw this documentary. I'll get, I'll get you that. But that did. Well, yeah, it reminds me of the old Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention song. Going to Who Min could imagine that they would freak out in Minnesota <laughs> was the line of the song. Yep. And here I was, 16, listening to Frank Zappa, and I'm going, hey, well, at least I think one of us is freaking out. Yes. Yeah. Are you talking about the first album, Freak Out? The, the first album, yeah. Oh, the man. very first. How many people know about Freak Out, the first I, Mother of Invention album. I still listen to it to, to this day. And that was 1960, I'm going to go 8. I'm going to say 68, maybe before. I'm going to go 67. Yeah, might might even be before that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, I here, here's how much I used to listen to it. Well, I'm about to get upset from watching my TV and checking out the news until my eyeballs fail to see. I mean, to say that every day is just <laughs> I another rotten myth. And when it's going to change, my friend, is anybody's guess. So I'm witching and I'm praying and I'm hoping for the best. Each time I hear him saying that, there's no way to delay that trouble coming every day. I and I could go on, but I won't. But I, see, I, do I it remember all the time. that from 1967, yeah. Jimmy. So you that, ready? You that's ready? how religiously I listen to it. June 27th, 1966. Holy 66. crap. Okay. 66. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah, I didn't get it till um the following yeah, I got I bought that in the summer of 67. That's when I bought it. I can tell you, I can tell you right now, uh and Frank Zappa's had this effect on anybody that's a Frank Zappa fan. Pretty much I could recite 
Any album that I was a fan of, you know, going back to the mid seventies of Frank Zappa, uh-huh. I can still, I can recite word for word every song on every album. <laughs> I, can, I can do it. I can do it. See, no I problem. It. Yeah, no problem. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. See, that's why I knew you were cool. You just that 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 was that was the big reveal right there. Now uh, now uh, let's get this set up for when we return. Um, at what point did you take the right hand turn, where you went, okay, all right, this crap ain't right. We're being fed a big bowl of of fruit and nuts here. What 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 happened? What tipped the scales? That happened between the ages of 16 and 18, um, clearly. Um, at 16, I, we had been living out by the lake there in rural Minnesota. It's summer of 1967. My mother's still living in Louisiana. She has now um, beca- gone to work for WBRZ Television in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which was, I think, the second largest television station. One of her duties, one of her jobs at the station was she set up I'm sure what they call this job, but she, whenever entertainers or celebrities or bands or anything would come to town, she was responsible for setting up their venues a lot, um, the booking, the hotel rooms, the limousines, all of this kind of stuff. She had this pretty glamorous job, right? Now I've been living out in this in rural Minnesota, you know, so um, other than the, the, the two and a half years I was in, small town Louisiana I'm I'm still living out there I'm 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 a pretty dumb naive country boy 16 you go to visit my mother summer of 67 so first thing that happens is we start partying with the who and Herman's Hermits and and Blues Magoos and these bands that are coming to town and I'm thinking this is really cool I'm going to so we decide we're going to stay there and live so me and my two younger brothers who were my dad's boys we move in with my mom she has actually an apartment. She buys a house. We move into a kind of a, a swanky subdivision of Baton Rouge. We start school. And very first day of school, it just started going downhill. I got sent home. My mother, the day, day or a couple of days before school, my mother had taken me and gotten this expensive, you know, I, of course, my hair had kind of gotten bushy over the summer. She took me and got this, uh, uh, you know, expensive razor haircut stuff. First day of school, I get sent home because... The, they send me my my homeroom teacher sends me to the office, so they go down there. They had two fingers above my eyebrows. My hair's it's touching your ears and it's touching your collar and back. So I got sent home from school the first day. So it really it went downhill from there, and I became very rebellious against what I saw as this kind of oppressive authoritarian system of idiots that were like pretty much thought they had it all figured out and. It just, I, I, I was a, you know, it was great until the day school started. So I managed to get through most of that year, but by the end of the year, I couldn't even, I couldn't stand even a minute in that school. So I started skipping school, getting in trouble, and I got in a lot of trouble uh, the last few months, early 68 and this, and so did my brothers, and we all got in so much trouble. Like one of my brothers, I got in so much trouble that he was, went to court and he was told he would go to, I guess, reform school for however long, or, or he could leave the state. <laughs> so wow. we came back all one year down there. I then moved back to Minnesota. And in the interim, my grandmother had passed away, who I was very close to. Um, and in fact, it happened that summer of 67. We, we had come down there and it was just a few weeks before school started, actually, when the news came that she had passed away. So I had this whole, and I was very close to, to my grandmother. My, and so I had this kind of this, what would you say? I was grieving. I was internalizing this grieving. So I had this going on psychologically and emotionally when I went into, went to this new school environment. So the second day, I guess it was a school, I'm going from one class to another, and I get surrounded by a group of the local um, whatever. They were, you know, the cool guys of the school. And they surrounded me, about five or six of them, to tell tell me how much they didn't like guys like me. So I kind of became an outcast for that year that I was down there. Gotten a lot. The, the, the people I started hanging out with were 
were not the good boys, you know, the, the exemplary ones. They were the troublemakers. So I, after a year of that, I came back to Minnesota and I had an attitude. I had really, it, within that year, developed this anti-authoritarian attitude. But once I got back to Minnesota, I kind of calmed down a little bit. I, You know, the last three or four months that I was living there in Baton Rouge, I mean, I was really blown out at both ends. And I, if I had kept doing that, I mean, I yeah. don't know where I would have ended up, well, you know, well, uh, carousing and partying and drinking and smoking and doing all these kind of things. Came back to Minnesota, and I just calmed down. And then that fall, fall of 68, I started going to, hanging out with, um, went down to this place in, in Minneapolis called the West Bank. And the West Bank was like the hate Ashbury of the Midwest. Okay, let me jump in right so, there. That's a perfect spot. I got to take a break. And let's do it now. And West Bank, let me get that down, because that's where we're picking up when we come back. Our guest tonight, Randall Carlson. We're going to do it all tonight. we got a lot to cover. It's going to be a great conversation. Stay with us. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. More with Randall after this short break. Stay with us. You're listening to a preview of Fade to Black. To get the full episode, go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get our podcast. Click on the podcast banner or sign up in the membership area for downloadable MP3s. Everything commercial free. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Randall Carlson is here. Buckle up, kiddies. It is going to be one of those conversations. And I always enjoy it when Randall is here. And right before the break... Uh, Randall, you brought up uh, West Bank, the Hate Ashbury of Minnesota. <laughs> now, if you're going to go and start to uh, figure things out about life, I would say that the West Bank is the place to be. <laughs> well, yeah, over the break, I was thinking, God, maybe I shouldn't have gone there. That might be a little too controversial. Um, nah, not at all. But what the heck? Yeah, not what at all. Heck? Not at all. Not at all. Well, see, the thing is, it's you. It, you know, it's part of of you. When I went to uh, San Francisco the first time, you know what I did? I didn't want to do, I didn't want to see the Golden Gate Bridge. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to see whatever, uh, the hill, the winding streets. No. I went straight to the Haight-Ashbury sign and took a picture under it. You know, they cross, right? Haight and Ashbury. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted to do. (laughs) And I did it. And you damn did it. (laughs) That's it. That's it. So I'm with you on that. I'm with you. And so uh, were you uh, Were you starting to research? Were you starting to get into this? Yeah, well, here's – I'll back up a year. When the, that, fir- that school, that first uh, day of school in Baton Rouge, there was another boy in my, ho- in my homeroom uh, who was also his first day of that school. He and his mother, his divorced mother, like I had, was with my divorced mother, right? He had just moved from California, just moved from L.A. So that first day, he and I got sent home. So we both actually got sent down to the office by our homeroom, instru- homeroom teacher. So right there, we, we bonded over that. See? Now, he had just moved from L.A., and, of course, he had managed to get in the scene out there. And so he was constantly telling me about the virtues of the psychedelic experience and all of this kind of thing. So he was my best friend for that year that I was down there. Mm-hmm. Um, is it okay to talk about yeah. that subject? Oh, yeah, Good. absolutely. Good. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> right. Good. Okay. <laughs> my kind of man. All right. So anyways, I haven't done anything. I'm, I'm totally innocent. I had tried my first puff of marijuana uh, early 68, he had gotten some. I tried. I tried again. I tried again. It did absolutely nothing for me. So I said, well, I guess I'm immune. And that was that was my, my attitude. Um, mm. This this stuff doesn't work on me. So I had just kind of lost interest in it. And then, so it's now fall. I'm back in Minnesota. Um, my grandmother has passed away the previous summer. The, there was a recession that pretty much killed my dad and my grandpa's business for a few years. So in order to get through that, my dad sold the house we'd been living in. And he and his new wife and their young son, my half-brother, had moved into my grandparents' house. 
right? My grandfather was living there in the basement. My grandmother was gone, so it was just my grandfather alone. We, me and my two brothers came back. We're all living in this little house in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. And I go back to, I go back to high school. I'm, I'm in my senior year of high school, back to the same high school that I had gone in my sophomore year. Um, but I'm now making up because I've pretty much blown my junior year completely. Um, I can still remember my, my getting my final report card was five F's and a B, and the B was for phys ed. So you can see academically, <laughs> I pretty much was a complete washout. Right. Um, so I came back and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to do better. I'm going to make up for this bad year, and I took kind of an extra course or two. So come the come spring of '69, when I would have normally graduated. I was just, I was two credits short. So I didn't get a diploma. Um, I actually ended up going back, uh, what was it, three, in 1973, taking a two month program, um, taking math, actually, because I loved math. And uh, my my uh, high school awarded me a diploma from, you know, so I, I get, over the years, I've constantly, regularly gotten contacted for, um, you know, class reunions for class of 1973, which of course was four years behind me. Um, but anyways, I'm, I'm back in high school now. I'm 17. And at this point now, I'm becoming aware of the Vietnam War because my older brother has gone into the Air Force. Um, my, uh, I've got a couple of friends that I've grown up with, the guys that I know that are a year or two older than me. They're over they, they've been drafted. My uh, my best friend, the, the the farm boy that I grew up with, his older brother was over in Vietnam. So up until this point, I've been pretty much oblivious to to what was going on. It was just something on the other side of the world that didn't involve me. You know, I mean, as a kid, that's kind of how you, you get through that stuff. In my teenage years, I was more interested, you know, at 15 and 16, you know, I, the things I was interested in, which mostly, I guess, at that point was girls. Um kept me distracted. I didn't pay any attention to the Vietnam War. Now I'm back in Minnesota and suddenly, you know, it's, it's 68 and that's the big year. That's the Tet Offensive and, and where things really began to, to go crazy over there. You know, that was the, when the, when the, the um, demonstrations really began in earnest, it was, you know, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the assassination of Martin Luther King, you know, the, 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 the riots at the, the, the Democratic Convention, so, you know, all of this stuff is going on, and I'm 17, and I'm really just now becoming aware of all of this and, and, and realizing, oh, my gosh, you know, the things that are going on out there in the world are going to affect me directly, whether I like it or not, apparently. Yeah, the uh, the contrast between growing up in a rural area and not, you know, your world is, you know, the forest and the lakes and your home. Yeah. And now, yep. now we have riots in Detroit and Los Angeles and and uh, in Chicago at the at the convention and assassinations and this brutal war going on in Vietnam and the activism uh, that was going across uh, this nation with your generation, and you start to yep. realize at that point that the world is not what it seems, right? Exactly, exactly, and. So there's these two contrasting things going on. On the one hand, there's that. There's the war, the, the, the ever-present war. It got to the point where, you know, it was like this black cloud hanging over you every day. Whereas up until, I guess, I would say that summer of 68 when I moved back from Baton Rouge is when I really, you know, started realizing, thinking about, oh, yeah, there is a war going on, and it's getting bigger. And I'm knowing people now that are getting sucked into it, you know, getting drafted and being sent over there. Um and then I had, uh, I guess, let's see, it was a, his, I, I won't give the whole name. His name was Tom. He was, I knew these two brothers. They, they were living on a neighboring farm. They wrote, I'd ridden the school bus with them for years. Um, I think the youngest brother was a year younger than me, and the older brother was a, a year older. Tom was a year older. And so he got drafted. And I, I, I wasn't good friends with him, but I'd known him. He was a nice kid. I'd known him for years. We'd kind of, you know, known each other since literally from first grade up through high school, right? So he went off. He became a, a, a gunner in a, in a heli- helicopter. So 
I saw, I've, now it's gotten vague who it was. I think it was his younger brother, but no, probably not his younger brother, somebody that was a mutual friend. And I said something about, well, you know, what's Tom? Is Tom back from Vietnam? And said, well, yeah, he got sent back. Um, you know, they got shot down and he was killed. And then he went, I said, and they sent, you know, I heard from his brother that the remains they sent back wouldn't, would have barely filled a shoebox. And that was just really shocking to me. That was very shocking to me to hear that this kid and thinking about what had happened to him. And, and it, I, I remember that was kind of a turning point for me where, where I really started going, what the hell is going on here? You know? Um, and so it's fall of 68 now. And, I'm thinking about a lot of things, and I, I, I was a, a, a fervent reader. I read all the time, and the Life magazine had come out, um, or was it Look? One of the two had come out and had done a, a feature article on LSD, and you know it was actually probably a few years older before LSD became demonized, uh, as, it, as it was really during the Nixon years, um, when they were still thinking that LSD was going to be a very positive psychological tool. Right, um, right, that right. Was, you know, um, and I, I remember reading about that. And then my friend in Baton Rouge had 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 done it about a dozen times. So he was constantly talking about the experience and how incredible it was and this and that. And so I just decided I wanted to find out more. So I started going down to the to the West Bank, which was meant the West Bank of the Mississippi River. Now, the University of Minnesota is on the East Bank. The West Bank was kind of a uh, bohemian area. It was it's also called the Cedar Riverside area. And it had one time been settled by the, the Scandinavians. So when I was a kid, I, I can remember my grandfather, who was an immigrant from, from Sweden, came over when he was 16 years old on a cattle boat riding with the cattle, right? So that was my grandfather that was the carpenter that worked with my father. And I remember him referring to it, and they used to call it Snooze Boulevard. And this was where all, where all the, the, the Swedes and the Scandinavians lived. But by the 60s, it had it had metamorphosed into this bohem, bohemian area. It had a lot of coffee shops and art houses and cafes, and it was kind of where all of the, you know, sort of the, the bohemian crowd, the, the the beats, you know, hung out there. Um, some of Bob Dylan's first public gigs were in the Cedar Riverside area. Um, you know, there was so there was a, a whole music scene, and then of course. 66 to 68 you could go down the street just like you could almost you know in any big major city and it's like an open air market there was like two blocks it was an open literally like an open air market you could get anything you want for the most part right yeah. so i got to know some people down there and and you know i pretty much before i knew it i was part of that whole scene you know for the next for the next year um and i experimented a whole lot the following summer, which was the summer of 69, was pretty much when I terminated because at that point, even though I'd had nothing but good experiences, um, there was some really strange stuff showing up. And how that stuff got there, interesting question. There were, the word on the street was that it was deliberately being put out there, that the Nixon administ administration, of course, who, who started the DEA and launched the, the drug war, he was trying to you know, show how evil these drugs were, So, but the statistics weren't really supporting it. So there was actually, I've read several things, it's been years, but, you know, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But it was certainly the speculation that there was really bizarre, strange stuff being dumped deliberately on the street so that people would freak out and there would be more emergency room calls because there's some really weird stuff showed up. Um, and at that point is when I decided to, I didn't know what I was getting anymore. So, you know, I, I, at one point I had, I was second in line to Sandoz Laboratories, third, third in line, if Sandoz Laboratories. Um, so that was the source. And then that source ended. So kind of my experimentation was fall of 68 to the fall of 69. Um, and then I quit because, you know, you just, you didn't know what you were getting anymore. It, it became too risky. But in that interim, I felt like, um, you know, and I also did a lot of peyote. I'll admit that, too. I did that about a dozen times, and I would do it. I discovered that if you went out into nature, that was really the place to do it. Right. Um, and it opened my eye. I mean, I'll have to say that that summer of 69, 
having these experiences out. We would go uh, camping in western Minnesota, for example, or go up. There's a place we used to go called the, it was the St. Croix, along the St. Croix River. Now, the St. Croix River forms the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin for for pretty good ways, maybe 100 miles or so. And, and it's got its head, the head of the St. Croix River is almost up at, to the southern terminus of Lake Superior. Now, where we used to go, even as, as kids, we used to go there, our, our dad, and I'd go up there with my dad and with my grandparents sometimes. There's a place called St. Croix Falls. And in this, what it is, it's, it's a basalt bedrock outcrop along the river. And along the shelf, which is maybe anywhere from 50 to 100 feet, there's a basalt shelf on the west side of the river there. And in that basalt shelf are these gigantic potholes. Some of them are 20 feet wide and 80 feet deep, mm. round circular holes that have been drilled into the bedrock, right? And, in fact, the last when, – when I was – guiding Graham Hancock across north the Pacific Northwest, you know, we ended uh, in Minnesota at Minneapolis for the Paradigm Symposium. Um, but the last, so the last site, I, what I did was I took Graham on, uh, you know, we visited dozens of sites so that he could understand the, the, the catastrophist geology that he was writing about magicians of the gods. Our last field stop was these potholes on the St. Croix River. And I have some really interest. I was down inside one of the potholes. I've got a really great picture of Graham peering over the rim down into this, uh, which were the one I mean is probably 40 feet deep. But so we, I had gone there as a kid frequently, and 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 I would certainly have to say that 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 pothole, those potholes there, were very intriguing to me. And I remember my grandmother telling me that there had been you know, that they had been eroded by water, lots of water, you know. And so, of course, now I understand that, yes, I, what happened there, it's a constriction in the bedrock, and you had this tremendous meltwater flood discharging off of what's called the superior lobe of the core, of the Laurentide ice sheet. So when the, when the ice was melting back catastrophically, these huge meltwater floods came down and essentially cut the, 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 the canyon that is now the modern pathway of the St. Croix River. So that was one of the places I used to go to do my, um, you know, my uh, experiences. Um, or camping out on the prairie of, of western Minnesota was another one. And so being out there and being, there was one in, in 1969 where we were, you know, doing um, some really, some really nice stuff. And we had set up our tents. We were going to camp out on this ridge in a place called Pipestone, which which is uh, refers to the uh, stone that the Plains Indians would quarry to make their peace pipes out of. And this area where we were camping was always considered to be sacred land. And, and even warring tribes, when they were there extracting this red clay stone to use for their peace pipes, recognized the sanctity of this area and wouldn't, wouldn't engage in any violent or aggressive acts there. So we were camping there, and this um, storm front came up, and right in the middle of this, this uh, you know, tripping on this stuff mm -hmm. was in what turned out to be the the most ferocious storm of the decade, according to a park ranger we talked to next morning. Um, so I, coming through that, it was like just like this experience of the raw power of nature. Right. And I became so, uh, you know, just obsessed with this really how the world worked, how the natural world worked, how phenomenal and how miraculous and how profound the whole system is. I, I, that summer of 69 is where I totally came away with these experiences, convinced that, that there was something major to understand about this world in which we live, that, that, that there's, there's a mystery. Everything about it became mysterious to me. And since then, I, I've been obsessed with curiosity about what is the and, and of course, I can look back now and I can remember, like for example, there was a hill to the where we lived there. There was a hill to our um, east where I could go up on this hill, and it, it gave me a, a very panoramic perspective of the land for miles around. And 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 there would be times I remember going up there and sitting up there. And it was mostly overgrown with alfalfa. And some summers, the alfalfa might be 18 inches deep and 
green and cool and I would sit up on this hill and watch the weather systems coming in from the west, these great armadas of cumulus clouds coming over, and you could see the, sh- the, the shadows of, the- you've probably seen this and know what I'm talking about, the shadows of the clouds are running over the landscape, doing their best to keep up with this armada of clouds that are sailing overhead. Right. And I would sit, and the wind would blow, and it would create, in the alfalfa, it would be like waves. How can I describe it? It looked like waves, green waves, sweeping across the fields of alfalfa. And, of course, you know, I'm, I'm 12, 13, 14 years old and just completely high, just completely enraptured with this whole experience. And as I'm looking out, I can still remember this sense this, that I couldn't put my finger on, that I couldn't describe, but a sense that, that there was a mystery or a meaning in this landscape. That, that there was meaning. It wasn't just a hill, a random hill or a random Or a tree. Right, right, right. Right. It, it was, it was, there was a meaning there. It was like, it would be maybe somebody like who didn't know how to read, who was illiterate, but looking at a book and going, I know there's meaning there. I just can't <laughs> decipher it. Right. You see? So somewhere along the line, that, that, um, idea, that, <clears throat> that way of thinking about the world just, uh, it, it became part of my psychology, and I've been that way ever since, obsessed with understanding the hidden meaning of this world. I guess that's the only way I can put it. And uh, let's set this up for when we come back. Um, at uh, What was the, you know, because I have, I have my memories of this, and I, I still stand by them. What was, like, the, the turning point fact you know, from a book or from from a researcher where you went, okay, all right, here we go. You know, the yeah. one thing. Uh, do you remember what that was? Well, I would say if, if we jump forward now one year, mm-hmm. summer of 70. Right. I spent most of the whole that summer for, all, well, really the better part of four months just traveling around the western part of the of the United States. Um, spent a lot of time in Colorado, but I hitchhiked, hiked, rode with a buddy for a while, um, and went through Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Washington, Montana, um, that, oh, parts of Oregon. So, and with a backpack. So I spent about four months with a backpack going around and, and sleeping out by the side of mountain creeks and up, you know, on, on, Mountainsides spent um, about two or two to three weeks up, right, almost camped out on the Continental Divide, uh, right up uh, at the foot of Mount Audubon, and so that definitely had a major, major, made a major impression on me. Um, you know, in terms of this sense that I had that there was some kind of a hidden meaning to the world, um, really gelled that summer and spending that time. Um, you know, out there, you know, I slept out pretty much under the stars every night for those four months, um, you know, and then would wake up and, you know, I spent a week in the Black Hills of South Dakota camping out, um, you know, went out to Olympic Peninsula and and stayed out there for whatever, four or five days camping on the peninsula, you know, in Montana, in Washington. And, and I think the one thing that really left a big impression on me something that really instigated this sense that there was something, some meaning that needed to be extracted from the landscape was going along, going, taking this, uh, uh, with, with, with actually with a friend of mine at that point, he would join me in my travels and he had a Dodge van and we were driving through the Columbia Gorge. Um, that forms the border between Washington and Oregon. I don't know if you've ever made that drive through the I have. Columbia Gorge. I have. You know, you know how how spectacular, and impressive it is. How massive the gorge is, and when you see these tributaries coming in, and there are these massive delta terraces built out from the mouths of the tributaries that I, I, that really impressed me. Like, what are what is this? You know, so that summer of 70 and spending those four months is is sort of what clinched everything for me from that point on i was i began you know reading whatever i could get my hands on that would would tell me more about that and so i was led into um of course i'm sure you and a lot of your listeners have, have heard of emmanuel velikovsky 
his work was available in the early 70s. So I remember reading him and, you know, at that point, you know, he one of the things that he did was he began to integrate um, catastrophism, geological catastrophism, paleontological catastrophism with mythology, right? That was kind of what he did. Now, he, he's, been, he's been really criticized by, um, you know, mainstream scientists. And, you know, what he was doing back in the 50s, he was laboring under the, the limited – uh, amount of knowledge we had at of that the, yeah well we, also, well uh, we need to take a break right here but what we knew and understood about the universe and the solar system compared to today was limited yes. but yes. his outlook on orbits and worlds and how we got here was absolutely without a doubt revolutionary and it caused randall in my opinion it caused us to ask questions And that's what we're going to do when we come back. Let's continue this conversation. Absolutely amazing. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Randall Carlson. I'm your host, Timmy Church. Stay with us. You have just listened to a full hour free preview of Fade to Black. To get the full show, all archives, just go to our podcast section at jimmychurchradio.com. You can also sign up to be a Fade or Not in our membership area, where we have downloadable MP3s. Go to jimmychurchradio.com. Go Bagley Tappy.